From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Don Hancock, Johnny. Surety Mutual. Hi, Don. What's on your mind? Qui bono. Qui who? It's Latin, kiddo. Qui bono. Who benefits? All right, I'll bite. Who does? A little doll named Luann Parker down in Green Pass, Virginia. A hundred thousand dollars worth, Johnny. Double indemnity. Wow. What did she do? Answer the question? She sure did. With a thirty-eight. Two bullseyes right in her foster papa's heart. Well, then if it's an open and shut case, you don't oh, need... Oh, it's that all right. She's the gal what done it. She admits it. But the coroner is about to call it an unavoidable accident. Seems little old Magnolia Blossom thought Papa was a prowler. And what do you think? Just what I said. Qui bono. So? I think you'd better put yourself on the payroll. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Qui Bono matter. Item 1, $78.45. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Green Pass, which was a village of some 12,000 people, hidden among quiet wooded hills, and located, as I discovered on arrival, some three miles from the railroad station. Nice weather we're having. Yeah, it's fine. You from New York? Well, near there, Hartford. Bet you ain't been having weather like this up there. No, no, it's been pretty cold. You say your name was Dollar? Yeah, Johnny Dollar. I'm Jake Deagley. You here on business? That's right. Well, I wouldn't count on finding much here. Green Pass is what you might call a one-horse town. One hotel, one bank, one taxi, that's me. One newspaper. And one county attorney. Yep, just one... Oh, and you've heard about our tragedy, about Dan Parker getting shot. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm an investigator for an insurance company. I see. Well, it was a terrible thing. It was... Oh, doggone it, doggone it. If old man Hawley don't fix up them fences, he's going to be short a cow one of these days. That's the third time this week they've been out the road. How do people around here feel about Dan Parker? Was he well-liked? Well, he'd been re-elected for five straight terms. No personal enemies? Not a one. There ain't a man in Green Pass that... Hey, what difference does it make whether he was well-liked? You know how he was killed, don't you? Yeah, I understand he was shot accidentally by his stepdaughter. That's right. And what difference does it make whether he had any enemies? Well, none, probably. But when an insurance company holds a policy as large as the one they carried on Dan Parker, they want to know the full circumstances surrounding the death. Well, there ain't no mystery about it, Mr. Dollar. That poor girl took him for a burglar and shot him, that's all. And it mighty near broke her up. Say, what about her, Jake? Is she well-liked? Well, let me put it this way. I'm 52 years old. I got a grandson, 17. And we're both in love with Lou Ann Parker. I see. And there's 5,000 other males in Green Pass that feel the same way. She get along all right with her stepfather? They worshipped each other. She was all Dan had since Mrs. Parker died nine years ago. They was thicker than thieves, them two. Rode horseback together, went fishing, took trips together. Well, then it's understandable that she'd be pretty broken up. It was terrible for her. She went clean out of her mind when she realized what she'd done. So tell me, was Dan Parker a wealthy man? No, fairly well to do for these parts, but no way as wealthy the way you'd think of it in New York, for instance. Then I imagine the Parker girl would think of a hundred thousand dollars as being a pretty sizable fortune. Mr. Dollar, let me give you a little advice. Oh? Uh-huh. You got a job to do, fine. But if I was you, I'd be mighty careful how I went about doing it. Why so? Well, people up here in the hills are kind of standoffish at best. And if you go around hitting what you seem to be hitting at, you're going to get yourself a mess of trouble. <laughs> I don't deal in hints, Jake. All I'm trying to do is dig up all the information possible. Let the company know exactly what happened. That sounds fair enough, Mr. Dollar. But you take my advice. Dig easy. (laughs) 
Jake Digley's one-man taxi service dropped me off at the town's one-man hotel. I signed in, left my bags, and did a quick resume of the case which Don Hancock had given me in New York. I tried pumping the hotel proprietor, but when he found out who I was, he frosted up like a mid-julep on a sultry day. But he did tell me I could find the sheriff across the square at the town's one pool room. It turned out to be a one-man place, too. And at the moment, Sheriff Jim Peterson was the one man. Uh Uh-huh. Well, glad to know you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Just thinking now. Uh, Watch me get that uh, three-ball down there. (laughs) Good shot. No, that was a setup. You couldn't miss one like that if you wanted to. Uh, that something on your mind, sir? Yes. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm here in connection with the Parker case. I'll see. Oh, got it. Well, I don't think I'd call it a case exactly. It was an accident. There ain't no mystery about it, as far as I can see. I didn't mean to imply that there was, Sheriff. As it stands now, this is a routine investigation, nothing more. I just like to get the facts, find out exactly what happened, in order to furnish my company with the report they need to pay the claim. I'd uh, appreciate your cooperation if you've got the time. Oh, I got the time, all right, sir. Yeah, well, how much you know about it? Well, uh, not much. Dan Parker, as I understand it, was your county attorney here. His stepdaughter, Luann Parker, who is the beneficiary under our policy, mistook him for a prowler, shot him, and killed him. Now, that's about it. Uh, well, the thing happened three nights ago. Dan had been up to Richmond on business, and he'd come back in on the midnight train. He walked down from the station. Walked three miles at that time of night? Well, it's a little over two to his place. It's outside of town a ways. Well, that's still quite a walk. Why didn't he call this uh, taxi driver, Jake Digley? Yeah, well, he probably did try to, but Jake wasn't expecting any business, so he took a night off. He was out at Happy Hollis. See, that's a kind of a roadhouse about five miles up the highway. Does Dan's daughter have a car? Yeah, she does. But I figure he didn't want to bother her at that time of night. See, he wasn't due in until the next afternoon. But it appears like he finished up his business and decided to come on back at night without letting Lou Ann know or anybody else. Now, let me see here. Was he in the habit of coming back unexpectedly from trips? Mm, no, I wouldn't say he was. Go on. Huh? Oh, well, uh, Dan didn't take many trips. And when he did, he most always made arrangements with Jake or Lou Ann to meet him at the station. I see. So, anyway, he walked home that night, and he took a shortcut through the lane and come on in the back way across the terrace. And right there was his fatal act. Oh, what do you mean? He bumped against the lawn chair. And the sound woke up Lou Ann. And then she heard him fumbling with the lock of the back door and heard him come on in the house. She took a thirty-eight pistol from a drawer of her night table and went to the head of the stairs. When she heard him start up, she fired twice and killed him. Mm-hmm. Were there any lights on in the house? No, she was afraid to turn on any light. And I reckon Dan was trying to keep from waking her up. Two shots, two bullets in the heart, firing down a stairway in pitch darkness. That's pretty good shooting, Sheriff. Oh. Well, she can out, out shoot me, Mr. Dollar. And I'm known as one of the best in these here parts. Uh, who taught her? Well, Dan taught her himself. He figured a girl ought to be able to protect herself. So tell me something, Sheriff. Did she have any reason to think it might be a prowler? Have you have you had any trouble of that kind around town? Oh, three weeks ago, there was a house broke into over on the south side. And twice since then, Dan called me in the night to come out and take a look around his place. Oh, why? Well, it seems Lou Ann thought she heard somebody trying to break in. And did you find anybody? Nope. Was Lou Ann alone in the house the night of the shooting? Well, Mary Jackson was there. Who, uh... Well, she'd been housekeeper for the Parkers for the last 15 years. Uh-huh. What's her version? Same as I told you. She heard the shots, saw the lights in the hall come on, and heard Lou Ann scream, Father! How did the girl and her father get along? Well, couldn't have been any closer. She pretty broke up about it. Uh, you talked to her yet, Miss Dollar? No, not yet. No, I didn't think so. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I mean, if you had, you wouldn't be asking a lot of these questions. Or at least you wouldn't be asking them in the way that you are. What way, Sheriff? Well, like you figured the Parker girl was actually guilty of something. Well, she did pull the trigger, didn't she? And with sufficient reason. She was nervous. She'd heard prowlers around before. 
or at least thought she did, which adds up the same thing. She thought she heard somebody break in. She knew she couldn't count on Mary for any help. She had a gun, knew how to use it, so she got up her courage and done a natural and normal thing. She used it. And she'll regret her mistake the rest of her life. Yeah. yeah that's the way the picture seems to work out. At the moment, at least. You got any reason to doubt it? I get paid to doubt things, Sheriff, until I satisfy myself that there's no reason to doubt them. And that's all I'm trying to do. That's all the insurance company expects me to do. I'm not out to pin anything on this girl or to get out of paying her claim. Provided it's legitimate. It is. Well, then she's got nothing to worry about. If the thing happened as you just told me it did, then I have as much sympathy for her as you do. It'll be a pretty rough memory to live with. I just want to be sure, that's all. All right, Miss Dollar. You look around, you talk to people, ask any questions you have a mind to, but you're going to come out right back where you started at. You're probably right. Dan and me had been friends for years. Good friends. Now, if I thought there was the slightest doubt about this, I would be the first one to kick up a fuss and go after the truth. Even if the evidence pointed toward Luann Parker? No matter where it pointed to. Well... Now, look, I want to talk to the housekeeper and to Miss Parker herself, and I'd like to attend the coroner's inquest, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind, but you're a little late. Huh? It was hailed this morning. What was the verdict? Death by misadventure, unavoidable accident, with no recommendation for prosecution. I see. Would it be possible for me to see a copy of the transcript? It would. I'll ring the coroner and tell him to expect you. But let me give you a little piece of advice, Mr. Dollar. All right. Folks in these here parts love that girl. So when you start walking around asking questions, walk easy. I went over the coroner's report and found nothing. Lou Ann had been called as a witness and appeared to have answered all questions in a frank and a straightforward manner. I checked her school record. She was regarded as an unusually bright girl and had stood at the head of a class all through high school. She'd been elected cheerleader in her junior year, won the lead in the class play, had been chosen queen of the senior prom. She was the town's darling. They worshipped her. And I could see that casting any aspersions on her would be like an attack on the crown jewels. I began to feel like a peeping Tom, like a louse, like I was wrong. And yet, qui bono? Who benefits? Two bullets in a man's heart and a $100,000 payoff. I had to be sure. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, beauty is as beauty does, and an idol is found to be made of flesh and blood. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>